Hey there. I am really excited to be here, and I'm really excited to see all of you. My name is Hazel Weekly, and welcome to Hacking the Pachyderm, Scaling Shares and People. A story about how me, a couple other people, and 30,000 plus friends um, decided to crash our half of the internet. And how did we survive that? How did we not survive that? What happened kind of in more detail? And how do we manage to unburn the computers without burning out the people? Let's dig in. I am the infrastructure witch of Hackaderm, and happy to be here. So first off, just as a quick sort of curiosity, how many of you know what Mastodon is? Awesome. So Mastodon is an elephant sanctuary that was created by some people who used to be avid bird watchers and really liked to watch things on avid bird watching apps, you know, blue bird apps. And um, suddenly, some people bought the most used bird app, and then all of a sudden, no one really wanted to do that. So a lot of people migrated to elephant watching, because uh, elephant watching is a lot more fun sometimes. You have to find your own herd of elephants. You can't just like join the one single flock. Everyone kind of hates each other, but also everyone gets along at the same time. And you can't, quote, tweet your elephants. But other than that, everything's normal. As a second question, how many of you joined Hackyderm during the elephant migration? Seeing a lot of hands, by a lot, I mean more than one, which is more than I expected. Super excited about that. So, uh, how many of you have a Mastodon account? So hopefully the rest of you will raise your hands and join Hackyderm because you're cool. Um, maybe not the coolest, but super cool. So. Let's dig in. The agenda we're going to talk about today is what is kind of the fetty thing for people who don't really know what it is, and then kind of explaining how that works, how the elephant thing was a thing, and then talking about how it's related. We're going to go into how Hackadur became the largest elephant sanctuary uh, on accident, one of the largest, and then challenges in undertaking the so great elephant migration. So. A one-on-one -on, -one on the Fediverse. This should fully explain everything you need to know. Um, in, in case that doesn't it, it explain it, uh, let's go over that. So we have the Fediverse, which is a collection of a whole bunch of people who don't agree about anything but kind of want the same thing to happen. Um, I've never <coughs> Linux heard of anything else like that, but same sort of concept. Uh, you have Twitter is not the Fediverse or anything else, but ActivityPub is not that either. And Mastodon uses ActivityPub as an underlying protocol, but it's not that either. And the Fediverse is not Mastodon, despite Mastodon being 97% of the Fediverse, but it's not that. You have this collection of a whole bunch of different technologies and trench coats pretending to be a social network. And so some of these protocols are at TiddlyPub, Diaspora, Zot, and some of the platforms are a whole bunch of ones that no one really cares about, except Mastodon, which also no one cares about. <laughs> and we're going to talk about kind of the platform and the protocol. There's only one protocol essentially people use, which is the one that Mastodon uses, which is at TiddlyPub. It's essentially rich structured JSON objects with an event bus and a pub sub network layered on top. So you can think of it as like Kubernetes manifests, but from 1997. <laughs> Used to implement something that people wanted to behave like email, but were really mad that Twitter was popular and wanted to recreate Twitter. And so they invented this. It didn't happen in that order, but it kind of happened in that order. And um, the Mastodon server was literally someone really wanted to clone Twitter and make that a thing. And so took entire, the entirety of Twitter's tech stack, duplicated it, and said, I made this. 
You can learn more here. There is 20 other links on the internet, which points you to 20 other links, which points you to 20 other links, and you can like draw out a giant diagram of all the knowledge, or you can just go to these two, which kind of did that. Or you can also not care. The architecture of Mastodon is very much a Ruby on Rails app. If you have PTSD, you can close your eyes. If some of you have fond memories of Ruby on Rails, I'm very sorry. Um, this whole talk is going to be triggering. You have Redis, which is used as both a volatile storage and a non-volatile storage, because that's exactly what you use Redis for. You have Sidekick, which is used to do a bunch of Sidekick things, and also things you probably shouldn't use Sidekick for. You have the file system, which could be the file system, or it could be S3, but it's usually the file system. You have Puma, which is used to do a bunch of things as in nothing, and also sometimes used to do things, and that's a problem. And then the streaming protocol is written in Node.js, and it has issues. And then there's Postgres, which everyone loves and never has any performance problems. So when we got into everything, here's kind of the overall timeline, and then we'll dig in. So the timeline for us was November 19, we were starting to build a version two of Hackader because people were starting to use it. And we realized that since we had gone from 700 people to 6,000 people in four days, and from 6,000 to 25,000 in seven days, and from 25,000 to et cetera. Um, it's like that game of chess where you like double a green device every move, and then your server crashes, and they have to keep going, and the people, anyway. So, we did that, and then we realized everything's breaking, everything's really breaking. Wow, everything's extremely breaking. Um, and then we kind of figured it out, kind of got over it, but the first whole week in there is just a trash fire where pretty much a lot of us are taking our laptops to bed, waking up, doing around the clock, ball of sun, sort of rotation, uh, voluntarily, but we did, uh, it, it was rough. So, the overall root cause of everything that happened here is two solid state drives are failing, which is the most unenlightening, useless garbage you've ever heard in your life, which is why root cause analysis are useless and you should never do them. Um, but really, like, what do you learn from that? Replace your disabled screen going to sleep. That's what you learn. Oh, I'm just going to remember to do that every five minutes. Excellent. Here is how we could have prevented everything from happening. How do we just know what to do in advance? So step one, be able to tell the future. If you could do that, um, I would like you to sell me a bridge somewhere. Like, it'll actually be, it'll, it'll work. Um, step two, know exactly what's going to happen. You know, do it, do everything. And um, so yeah, this is why root cause analysis are pretty like, they're individual insights, not systemic, you know, learning. And it also turns out that even if we do invent this time machine, the law of distributed systems is any problem that <laughs> is prevented before it happens will spontaneously reappear as a more fucked up and terrible solution. And you will never escape it. You will never escape it. So maybe don't try. Run Ruby on Rails. It'll be fun. Like I said, systemic adaption is much better than you know, individual insights. That's really what you want. You want that culture of continuous learning. So when we had the whole everything, it was on Nova's basement servers, very much dot com bubble. One computer under the CTO's desk, running half the internet, good old days. That's exactly what we had. We had an experimental ZFS build. We had a debug Linux kernel turned on for like doing exploit investigations with the Ukraine um, on Twitch. We had um, Mastodon serving all of its media off of NFS. We had the same host running Mastodon, Internet, Kubernetes, Postgres, Redis miscellaneous things, 
It was great, super stable, accidentally became production. So, like I said, here is kind of like this architecture. This is the really, really simple version. It's going to kind of look more like this. But this image actually serves to illustrate more like why you should never generate these images on the computer and you should draw them out by hand. This is much more understandable. It's still a mess, but it's because it's a mess. So you have, from this flow of movement, kind of as the user starts through the system, you hit the proxies, you hit Ruby on Rails, which is slow as balls, and so immediately it sends you off to something else in the system, which is usually going to be, it's either going to hit the database, or it's going to hit Sidekick, or it's going to maybe hit Redis. Maybe all three at the same time. Sometimes it will open up a transaction to the database. While it's open, hit the file system. While that's open, do something with Sidekick, which will do the same thing, and then close the transaction, because it's Ruby. I don't know. Um, and then you have the file system. If you notice, I put the file system connected to the database and connected to the media server as like one single file system that will be important later, as in why you shouldn't do that. But we have you know, all of these pieces, and I'm going to dig into each piece of the system, piece by piece, and then we're going to stitch it together chronologically at the very end. So I'm going to circle the section we're going over first, because this section, nothing really went wrong with it. It didn't cause us the most pain, which is surprising because Redis is also in that circle. Um, but it turns out that if everything else is breaking, it can break slower than everything else, and that's fine. So one thing that's interesting here is we have Nginx. And because Nginx was acting as a CDN and also a reverse proxy, what it was able to do was actually cache media images from the actual NFS server and then serve them from its own computer. So this was actually like five or six different random VMs somewhere running Nginx as a remote proxy and also CDN which disguised a lot of the performance issues of the file system because you would hit the file system once or twice and then the CDN more or less forever after that. And then you would never touch the image again. But it means that if your file system is failing, it will need to fail when the stars align or not fail once and then you're kind of almost safe. So it can cause a lot of like hiding things. So caching is great, also caching is caching. Um, try files was how we actually kind of saved the setup, but um, the exact order of operations really matters one, sometimes, and try files doesn't make that very clear. We had Puma, which is, it worked actually pretty all right. It worked pretty well. We didn't have a whole lot of issues with it, except for the fact that it had a very stable load and a very slow amount of limit. And so you would run into this thing of like, surely a single server can serve more than like 2,000 people. And the answer is eee. So every time we would scale up Puma, we would immediately get more people. And the amount of people was growing so fast that we actually continually scaled up Puma the entire time. So every time we would go, okay, you're safe now it would then immediately break on us about like eight hours later. That's how fast people were like adding on, uh, which is great. This is how I keep track of how much time I'm spending talking. Human behavior is often pathological for systems health. So we had streaming, which is the Node.js process. And so streaming, what it does is it causes bugs. What it's supposed to do is it's supposed to go into, essentially it serves you everything that you didn't need a page reload for. So your instant notifications, um, pushing things if you don't have slow mode enabled, things like that. It has one small little quirk, which is if you are a big account with a whole bunch of followers 
and you migrate to our instance, you probably want to check if it's working. So you're going to do the migration, then you're going to open up the notifications page and you're just going to sit there. As tens of thousands of requests hit the database instantly. Because every single time it sends notification, it must read from the database. Why? No idea. This is not actually necessary, but currently it does this. Since the database is on the file system, normally that's fine. Sometimes it's not, which is if your file system is broken, maybe don't do that. So Redis, despite you know all of the eternal hate for Redis, in this particular case, it did not actually cause too much trouble. We pretty much just settled up and then never looked at it again. Um, however, it is the only key value storage in the world in which actual correctness is a paid feature, and you should probably know that. Don't ever run Redis on your own. Make someone else force you to make that choice. Um, it's also, it has like two modes of usage, and it has Sentinel mode and the actual clustering ability. Mastodon can't use the actual clustering ability, so you have two Redis servers that you can use, and that's it ever. So Mastodon has a permanent scaling limit on whatever the fuck you can serve out of two Redis instances, both of which can only use one CPU core. So I recommend if you want to like recreate Twitter at scale that you invest in liquid nitrogen and overclocking. <laughs> the other section, this is where all of the pain came from. And I mean all of the pain. So we're going to dig into this and a lot more sorry and we'll be involved. There, right there, is a sidekick. One of the most dangerous Q implementations in all the planet. One single misconfiguration, and your queues are fucked. I'm going to scale it manually. So Sidekick in Macedon has several, and I mean several different queues, none of which are sensibly named, implemented, or utilized. Preemptive wiggly, this is called learning. The other massive problem with Sidekick in this particular instance is the CPU bursts are absurd because Sidekick can do anything from do a single read on a database to take a request, download an image, and then run image magic on that image to generate eight thumbnails. Save them to the file system and then close the database transaction. Naturally, its auto scaling capabilities are also neither auto nor scaling. And of course, since it has retry features in it, if anything goes wrong for any reason whatsoever, including its timeouts, which aren't tuned, then you can have it actually redo the image magic thing over and over. Because it won't save anything, because naturally you have to cancel transactions anyway. Don't do that. So this is an instance of like how bad the scaling can get if you try and like bring something up because some of the queues, you really need them to be very fast. Some of the queues are very expensive. Some of those are the same queue. Um, so systems only do this when they're in massive distress. And uh, we noticed this one day, we went hot. And then we you know, tried to address it, but it was funny. Am I funny? I mean, wow, I didn't know I could see a number that high. So these are the cues in Sidekick. <laughs> we have default, push, pull, ingress, scheduler, and mailer. The mailer queue handles emails and does nothing else. Naturally, it has its own queue because it's special. Default is about 476 different options in trench kill, all needed to be really, really fast and instantaneous. So you want to put a whole bunch of stuff in there. It sets default also sometimes it's the database. Okay, come on. Ah, yes, updates. Love updates. Cool, cool, cool. So push and pull 
moderately expensive, not too bad. You can mathematically map out exactly how many of those you need. Uh, ingress, that's the one that does the database transaction, does a whole bunch of image magic, does a whole bunch of other things. It's also literally the only way you get any images from anyone else outside of your server, or any action or content or response or reply or anything else. So you want it to happen eventually, because then you can't talk to your friends otherwise. So what would happen for us is we have this cycle of toil in which we would adjust all the queues, balance everything, and then the United States would wake up. I would say, okay, like all of our queues are like completely unbalanced and whatever. We only have so many cores, we only have so much RAM. The numbers need to kind of be here. And then we would both be wrong. And we just did that for like four days. During this process, one of the things we did to like break this uh, toil cycle was we went and actually, since your system was chaotic, we were changing the system faster than we could deal with it. Cool. Whatever. Maps are always functional. That's why you get them. Uh, so, when we implemented this automatic restriction on the human process, we were able to slow the human change down just enough to get to the point where we could start to like actually look at the system. So we're spending so much time firefighting, they weren't able to actually like look at the fire. And so it's really important to make sure that you know humans need circuit breakers, humans need actual like communication streamlined, back pressure, they're socio-technical systems. So be more social and less technical, but also more technical and less social. And also, what? Cool. Literally no idea. What if I just stand here and stare at it? So if you want to make change easy in a system, that's how you can scale it. But you don't want to make change easy to do, you want to make it easy to handle. And when you're making it easy to handle, this kind of thing happens. The human aspects need more technical implementations, the technical aspects need more human implementations. It should be painful to do things that are painful to your system. It should be easy to do things that are healthy for your system. And some of it is if your system is currently falling over, screaming, on fire, it should not be the easiest thing in the world to kick your wallet down. So circling in and zeroing in on this little cluster here of the actual pain. This was kind of the biggest thing overall that you know essentially killed everything. So you know how I said like we have this issue where you hit the file system in the middle of a database transaction? What if, okay, this is a great idea. What if you have multiple servers and you're like, I really want to access media on these multiple servers. How about I put some of the servers in Seattle, some of them in Germany, and connect to all of them with NFS? But make sure that NFS and this computer are constantly failing. That's right, I'm shaming you. So out of curiosity, if you're running a server for you, your buddies, your closest friends, and 30,000 other people that came and joined, how many IOPS do you think your system needs in order to do well? I know it depends, but like, really, give a guess. Just give a guess. It's got to be probably more than 300 because that was the total IOPS of our entire system. All of it. <laughs> Including the laptop. If you have Postgres on the system, 
and you're doing something called not using PG Bouncer. Um, stop it, that's bad, use PG Bouncer. But in the mean case, if you do end up not using PG Bouncer, you might end up in this weird loop of, it turns out, just having a high amount of match requests in your Postgres configuration could cause some queries to slow down by 46%, which of course means the file system will be accessed longer because Postgres needs to read more things, which of course means the file system is broken and then you're going to end into this virtuous loop of unvirtue and pain. Speaking of pain, here's the timeline again. Now we're going to go into the actual things. During the whole setup, I accidentally wrote the most comprehensive guide to like debugging everything because no one wrote down any information on how to actually fix this. Like there's not a single universal source until this one. So we started off with like, so we started off with trying to like, you know, do things right. And then eventually we came to, into realizing we had about eight hours before like total absolute failure. And can we get everything ready in eight hours or should we just lift and shift all of our shit over? And so that's exactly what we did. We uh, lift and shifted all of our shit. So the timeline again, really starting to build version two, we did it too late. The NFS caching hit the underlying issue. With the slow queues, we had firefighting distracting us from actually like looking at the system. And with moving everything to the EU to the US, we solved compute. We had enough cores to do things now. However, that broke the file system because we added an order of magnitude more of latency to a feeling system. Finally, we started to understand things to go, okay, it is the file system. But figuring out it was only doing 300 IOPS kind of gave it away. Um, and then acceptance, we moved the database to Europe. We did a couple of things. We did some try files magic in that actually managed to, when people requested something, we would asynchronously give it to them and then also upload it to S3 via try files, and in doing so, used the frequency recency magic of social media and people's access patterns to move all of the hot data off into DigitalOcean. So why didn't we notice this earlier? Um, it turns out we had no idea what we were doing. And regardless of how many metrics you have, regardless of how much data you have, it's really only so much of like, can you understand it? And it's really hard to understand your system if it's behaving magical. Because the whole system, we had like 10 terabytes of storage, 512 ish gigabytes of RAM across all the servers. We had like 80 CPU cores, 260 or so. We had also had people with expertise in running, say, NFS for millions of users or running Kubernetes for millions of users, or running like Ruby on Rails for hundreds of thousands or millions of users. So we all knew the system was not anywhere where it should be for these types of failures to be happening. But at the same time, couldn't really dig into what it could have been. And so it was really tricky to actually find that. Some contributing factors were, and so, one of the reasons it was hard is because there are so many different weird things going in to make this particular failure as bad as it was. So first off, the hard drives are failing. That's bad, makes things happen. But even if they had been failing, that wouldn't have actually caused the issue. You also needed NFS to be doing what it was doing. You also needed the database and the media on the same file system. You also needed Ruby on Rails accessing the file system inside the database transaction because that still wouldn't have like caused those deadlock sort of things to happen unless you had that loop of actually doing that. Uh, Transatlantic NFS increased the latency and the slowness of the file system enough to actually cause issues to happen more often. Surge of new people 
So what happened here was we went from 400 people to like 30,000 in two weeks. But every time a new person comes, a bunch of very expensive one-time things happen on Mastodon. So the load of the system was like anywhere from 10 to 50 times higher than it normally would have been for that amount of traffic. Simultaneously, every time a new person comes in from like a different server, you do a bunch of one-time things. Anytime a new server joins the network, you do a bunch of one-time things. And every time someone migrates to your server or migrates away from your server, you do a bunch of expensive one-time things. So it's as if we were running the whole system with an artificial multiplier of like 40. Which is, don't do that. Um, but on top of that, you have this sort of thundering herd of thundering herd of things going on where you would have like that retry going off and then retries and retries and retries and retries, which Psychic is configured to retry things for like eight hours before giving up. So you can turn 10 jobs into 600,000 pretty easily. Um, and the other kind of fundamental thing that's not necessarily addressed here is activity pub is exponential in that it's like an n squared thing to communicate to each other thing because nothing is centralized. And that is the biggest downside of, de of decentralization. And it's also why you have to run image magic on every image. Just because somebody gave you an image doesn't mean you trust them that it's an image. Just because they gave you an image doesn't mean it's just an image. It could have something else inside of it. You could be hiding documents inside of it. You could be doing whatever. So you kind of have to re-encode it. You kind of have to waste a whole bunch of CPU stuff. Or you centralize everything somewhere. That's why Twitter only needs 500,000 servers. I'm sure a few of them can be turned off. But Mastodon, to get that scale, would need even more. Much, much, much more. So much more because of that exponential issue. Other contributing factors. The big accounts joining, you know, cause those massive surges and those huge spikes all at once. And then bandwidth getting effects. People would join because the big person joined. So when Ian Coldwater joined our server, 600 other people joined within two hours, including a bunch of migrations, which meant that Ian single-handedly DDoSed our server. It was super great. And um, when Scott Hanselman joined, same thing happened. And so we actually had to put up a notice of like, if you're cool, you can join, just like warn us. Which is a very 1990s thing. <laughs> and uh, recency doesn't cash at all. So the access patterns of social media in general are so severe that it's ridiculous. Essentially, by and large, you can assume that an image will be accessed thousands of times in the first 10 to 20 minutes. And then the usage of that image will drop off to a cliff in the first five hours. And then it will essentially never, ever be accessed again after the next four. So within not even half a day, it's irrelevant, gone, never to be seen again. Unless someone just links to it, which they can randomly link to it for any reason, which is going to cause that to happen again. But faster. Why? Who knows? So like I said, root causes are individual insights. A whole bunch of individual insights in trench code doesn't mean you actually have systemic adaption. Systemic adaption, that making change easy to handle, those are those sorts of things that like really get you to a place where you can figure out how can we, as a system, as a social technical system, deal with things. Speaking of which, um, we did do some things that made this harder for ourselves than we needed to. So we could have, at any time, just given up run Kubernetes, we could have just given up, migrated to the cloud, we could have just kind of like said, eh, and solved some issues in the first place. And one of the reasons we didn't do that, it's actually pretty big, is at the time, Twitter had just blown up. 
At no point did anyone want to say, let's move to another corporate thing. At no point did anyone want to say, oh, let's just have some one person own everything, because we're explicitly trying to avoid that. And also really trying to answer the question of like, if you have a community of people, what does it really mean for that community to own something collectively? Particularly when it's a service. Because one of the evolutions of Web 2.0 or whatever is the idea that no one owns anything except for four people, which has worked out fantastically and should never be repeated. But what, is, what does it mean for that community ownership to happen? And as a result of trying successively to answer this, um, we kind of came to a weird sort of non-answer of we don't know. But we do know is that we want to find out. And so consequently, uh, Chris Nova actually created the nonprofit organization, the Nibbly Foundation, as an attempt to try and answer the question of what does it mean to enable communities to actually meaningfully own themselves. The other sort of like hidden thing here is if you have a situation in which you have a 24-7 sort of death march going on, people tend to quit. People tend to say, no, screw this. Um, but none of us did. All of us are fine. All of us stayed through this. All of us worked together on this. We came out of it nice, happy, and healthy. We took a break. We, we got some sleep. But none of us burned out. None of us left. Um, why? Great question. Um, we don't know. But some contributing factors we think are there is the sort of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation going on of like, if you pay someone to do a thing, it becomes an obligation, and that can be weird. So sometimes you find this in open source a lot, of if you pay someone to work on open source, it's no longer fun. If you pay someone to do something, it's no longer fun, it's no longer rewarding, like the dopamine kind of got taken away despite enabling the dopamine sort of thing. Um, aligned incentives throughout an entire group throughout an entire like purpose end to end are incredibly rare. And we had that. Everyone collectively had the same exact we want to do this. And in fact, when we initially started to like firefight this sort of thing, we all sat down and we said, do we want to take it the easy way out? Do we want to bail? Do we want to migrate things to hashtag corporate? Like what do we actually want to do here? What are we trying to achieve by like taking the hard way? And we realized we want to do this for the community. We want to make sure that they know we're doing it for them. We want to make sure that they believe that that's actually good for them, sort of thing. And like really have everything together. And those aligned incentives throughout the whole thing, constantly checking in with each other, constantly telling each other to take breaks, having those sorts of like gives and takes, collaboration, the sharing, psychological safety, it was immense. And I have never seen a group of psychological safety with an order of magnitude of this one. I don't know how we managed to achieve it, but you had people who were literally world experts in their domain talking to people who learned it that week. Equal playing field. You had people who were like, you know, they didn't invent the thing, but they kind of wrote the book on it sometimes. And same playing field. You have people going, let's just wildly try this. Let's try that. Let's do whatever. Equal playing field. Really, really huge amount of psychological safety, huge amount of enabling each other. That happens anywhere else. And I don't know how to recreate it, but if you can get that, burnout becomes much harder. Um, one other thing that I've noticed is if you choose your own solution, that helps immensely. Um, so one thing I see a lot with on-call is this continual tension and frustration for SREs of they didn't choose the solution, they didn't choose the tech stack, they didn't really get necessarily a whole lot of say in like how much they have to care about something, and like this sort of What's the solution? Can I just like turn this off? Can I whatever? Like you're kind of guided into the solution that collectively has been chosen as the best solution. Is it? Who knows? But when you get to choose the solution, you don't really care if it's the best one. You're likely you chose it. And 
that has a lot to do with it. I don't think it has everything to do with it. But the fact that we all sat down, trusted each other, shared each other, supported each other, said, do we want to do this? How do we want to do this? And had that unanimous consenting buy-in and follow-through really, really helped. So make change easy. But in a socio-technical system, it's not about making change easy to do. It's about making change easy to handle. It's about wiring those biological processes in a way that two people together are stronger, two people and the system together are stronger. Things that hurt you should hurt the system. Things that help you should help the system, vice versa. And then build something where the easiest way to get something done is the healthiest way to get something done, and the most, most supportive way to get something done. You will never be prepared for exponential scale. And this was something that we you know, kind of learned the hard way, in that if you survived it, it wasn't exponential. <laughs> kind of like people say sometimes, oh, it was an exponential something. If you survived it, it wasn't exponential. Because if you can see it coming and react in time, that reaction time is so slow. No matter how fast you think you are, no matter how well you think you know the future, it's just going to come back more fucked up and slam you into the ground. You'll never be prepared. But you can be prepared to support each other through the challenges you will face. Overall, operating Mastodon is pretty great. It has the reliability and ease of maintenance of a Rails application combined with the user experience of hosting your own mail server and the developed workflow of daydreaming and day drinking on Linux kernel mailing list. Try it out sometime.